The year is 1927. 29 people gather in Brussels to discuss physics. 17 of those people will eventually win a Nobel Prize. And for a few short days, in the middle of Leopold Park, they will wrestle with the smallest question, or perhaps the biggest one, to ever face mankind. The question at the foundation of everything. For those few days, those 29 physicists wrestled with the question of the quantum determinacy and whether our world at the minutest level operates as a fixed system or merely as a group of probabilities. Their question stemmed from one of the oldest problems in modern physics, the problem of light. For nearly three centuries since Newton wrote his famous treatise on optics, physicists had debated whether light was a particle or a wave. In 1803, this argument was thought to be put to rest by one of the most beautiful and simple experiments ever created, the double slit experiment. Okay, think of two buoys bobbing up and down in the water. As the waves spreading out from these buoys hit each other and overlap, they interfere with each other. If the peak of one wave hits the peak of another, they'll amplify and become a bigger wave. Same with the troughs. But if a peak of one wave hits the trough of the other, they'll just flatten out. They'll combine back down to nothing. A man named Thomas Young said, Let's take that principle and apply it to light. And so he did the simplest thing imaginable. He took a monochromatic light to make sure that all the light had the same wavelength, and he shone it on a partition with two small slits cut into it. If light acted like a particle, he should simply see two columns of light on the wall on the other side. But if light was a wave, then the waves coming through each of the slits should interfere with each other, amplifying and canceling each other out in places. And he would instead see a weird pattern of bright and dark lines as a result. And as he expected, he did indeed see that funky pattern. And that was that. The particle theory of light was done and dusted. He'd solved the dang thing. Now everyone could finally move on to talking about just how smart he was. But then physicists in other labs found something strange in their own experiments. They found that when light strikes a material, it can force electrons to spew out of it. This wasn't that startling, but the way it happened was all wrong, and definitely not how it should have happened if light was the continuous wave they'd believed it to be. Then in 1900, a man named Max Planck came up with an equation that fit. It made sense of what was happening, but as Planck himself would later say, it was an act of desperation. It went against everything he thought he knew. The only way he could get all of the math to work was by treating energy as something that could only be absorbed or released in discrete units. How could this be, he thought? How could energy not be continuous? How could it not be a flow? He had no idea. But then this fellow named Einstein took Planck's act of desperation and ran with it. He declared that light itself was quantized, that, in many ways, we can think of it as a particle of zero mass always moving at, well, the speed of light. And it is for this theory, not for special or general relativity, that Einstein was awarded his Nobel Prize. Because this concept, which we now call the photon, solved a number of lingering issues with how light interacted with the world. But the photon brings us right back to the problem of Thomas Young's double slit experiment. Because if light has both the properties of a wave and a particle, what happens if you fire those particles through the slits one at a time? Well, here is where this becomes the most astonishing and humble experiment ever devised. Because if you shoot one photon at the slits and detect where it hits on the other side, you'll find that it impacts some arbitrary point, just the way you think it should. And if you fire a second photon through, you'll find that it too shows up at some other arbitrary point on the other side. But if you do this enough times, you'll eventually see the same interference pattern build up that we got back in Thomas's original experiment. That is madness. Each individual photon, which should be completely independent of the rest, shows up at some seemingly random point on your wall and exactly where they show up will be different each time you run the experiment. And knowing where the previous photon appeared in no way allows you to predict where the next one will show up. Yet when taken as a group, 
it's as if they're affected by how they should interfere with each other. This feels impossible, and yet it is experimental fact. And the reason for this phenomenon is one of the most hotly debated mysteries in physics. Because the only way to conceptualize this is that each photon passes through both slits as a wave, interferes with itself, and then resolves down to a photon when it actually hits the wall. What is going on here? What is this? No, no, no. This is magic. This is magic. No, you're right, Zoe. I should calm down because we are not done yet. Because here is where it gets really freaky. Remember how when Thomas was first doing his experiment, we said that if light were really a particle, we should just see two columns of light on the other side of his double slit paper? Well, if you put a detector on the slits so that you can determine which slit the photon you fired passes through, that is exactly what you get. That's all you have to do. You don't have to change the experiment in any way or interfere directly with the photon. You simply have to measure which slit the photon passes through. Why does it do this? Because a photon is a particle and a wave. But it can't be both simultaneously. The mere act of measuring which path the photon took forces it to resolve the wave-like nature of the photon into a particle. And this may be the hardest thing to wrap your head around in all of quantum physics. Because the most common way to view this is that the photon, when acting like a wave, isn't a real wave at all, but rather a wave of possibilities. That wave represents where the photon could be, but not where it is. It's only when something acts to detect the photon, whether it be your measuring device or the wall on the opposite side of your double slit experiment, that the photon is forced to, for lack of a better term, decide on where it will actually be, and in doing so, becomes a particle. More unsettling still is the fact that these waves of possibility interfere with each other just like normal waves. The interference pattern we see from firing particles one at a time through the double slit experiment is caused by peaks and troughs of possibility, canceling each other out. When you fire that photon and the wave of possibility hits your double slit paper, it is funneled through as two possibility waves, just in the way that any regular physical wave would be. And just like those regular waves, waves of possibility interfere with each other, essentially making it so there are places where it is more or less likely for a photon to land when detected. Thus, when you fire a lot of photons one at a time through your double slit experiment, the bands you see are simply the high probability lines playing out. But if you think we're done getting weird, think again. We're only on episode one. So join us next time as we get serious about this idea that energy only comes in discrete packets and begin our journey on what this means for the future of quantum computing. We'll see you next time. Or will we just perceive you next time? Because would that mean we'd have to watch you watching us to know the... Oh boy. Oh boy.